Welcome to the OC24 podcast, where we've taken some of the best talks and discussions from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime, which showcases some of the most interesting research into organised crime around the world. This episode is called Criminal Business Models and Enablers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, which is Criminal Business Models and Enablers. Um... Welcome everyone and well my name is Dr. Diorella Islas and I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, it's about criminal business models and their enablers which is very important as you know since the enablers are the ones that are actually facilitating all the criminal groups to be able to merge and change as they grow and as they adapt to different countering criminal strategies. So today I'm going to present the speakers, which will have about 10 minutes to give their message to you. And then we will proceed to the question sessions in which you can either write your questions on the chat, which is at the bottom, or you would be able also to raise your hands. For the sake of time, when you speak with your questions, I will ask you to be brief and do not extend your preamble. Uh, I'm going now to present our speakers today a little bit for you, and then they're going to present themselves. First, we're going to hear uh, Hai Tan, who will present on Vietnamese cannabis growers in Australia, and then Anna Greta Pekarinen about business models and modus operandi of labor trafficking, then uh, Donato Fozza, and last but not least, Alexandra Dobrininas and Maria Schupa. Okay? So without any hesitation, I'll, I'll leave you with Haitan. Welcome, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's your very nice and kind uh, introduction, Dr. Dairela Ailas. Uh, uh, hello, everyone uh, from the anywhere in around the world. Uh, I'm from the Melbourne now. That is the morning, uh, the 1st December, as uh, the 2nd December. Uh, the same as last year, this year, I'm very happy to involve again and uh, sharing some of my uh, uh, initiative findings regarding to the Vietnamese cannabis grower or crop sister in Australia. Uh, I'm now the Associate Research Fellow in the RMIT University in the Melbourne, and uh, I'm also the uh, Senior researcher in the institution of uh, Asian crime and security uh, based on uh, uh, USA. Yeah, just very quickly it's because uh, we very limited time with uh, ten minutes uh, for uh, per the speaker. Uh, my is a part of the full the paper. You can uh, look at in the uh, institution of Asian uh, crime and security website. It's a full link I provide uh, later on. Uh, I'm focusing on uh, sharing about the uh, we call uh, heading cats of Vietnamese cannabis crops uh, in Australia, who they are and how they involve uh, currently. Uh, now, I, before the kickoff, uh, with focusing on the Vietnamese cannabis grower in Australia, I want to really brief about the literature reviews. Uh, uh, regarding crime and ethnicity or race. Uh, as you may know, the relationship between the ethnicity and organized crime is in a uh, stressable link. Uh, ethnic minority involvement may reflect social exclusion and even a function to, to assist researchers processing and evaluating the nature of drug trading. Uh, uh, I started the, my the transnational uh, crime career since 2010 when I started uh, my master in the uh, University of Oolongong and still pursue this topic uh, with uh, my PhD thesis, uh, focusing on transnational drug trafficking from the Golden Triangle to Southeast Asia and beyond. And some of my uh, uh, earlier publications uh, looked for and tested and clarified both uh, family ties and fellow countrymen at its most priority forms of those Vietnamese drug trafficking networks to recruit and operate 
on the regional and national scale. It is a very important thing. Uh, during the over 10 years, I demonstrate for Vietnamese, not only in the uh, domestic market, but also in the Deporas community in overseas, uh, family ties and fellow countrymen's association where they are similar village, similar the class or the language or habit, etc. They create and make establish a very close network. How about the Vietnamese criminal syndicates in Australia? Uh, perhaps I kick off with after 4 to 1975. Uh, most of some of you, if uh, is a concern uh, we can image about the boat people who are most of them is the refugees after a US war, uh, 1975. Uh, they fled, most of them use the, the sea routes uh, go to the Western society, including with Vietnamese. That's why uh, some terminology we call it the boat people, not only discrimination. Uh, yeah, after that, uh, in, in, in the New South Wales and Victoria, in uh, two largest uh, states and crowded the population, uh, Vietnamese refugees, they established very close community. And one of the most, uh, most dangerous gangs is the 5Ts, uh, stand for five Vietnamese who was starting with the T, Ting Tien Tu To, to uh, translating to love, money, prison, punishment, death, or in other words, uh, some, uh, sometimes they also translate the fighting gangs also means tuổi trẻ thiếu tình thương, which roughly translate to childhood without love. That's why most of them, they create uh, based on your teenager, juveniles. Yeah. And the one big case study regarding to uh, John Newman, First political assassination in 1994, he was shot and killed outside his home in Kramata. Kramata now is the largest Vietnamese community in, in not only in Australia, but also maybe second one after only uh, uh, in, in California in US. That's why Kramata is the biggest, largest Vietnamese uh, population now. And they kill, uh, they kill the zone Newman. And uh, uh, the prime uh, suspect of Chi Ming Chen, 21 years old, and the leader of the fighting gangs. Uh, the Fung Ho local club owner and political opponent who had run against Newman as independent 1991 was convicted of this murder, 2001. You can look in the link if you want to further detail. Uh, since 2000, uh, normally under the outer uh, literature and also the, my, the Vietnamese uh, organized crime the scholar network, uh, we look for very rarely violent involving uh, by the Vietnamese criminal syndicates in Australia. It's uh, perhaps they use violence to threat or extortion uh, regarding to money, debt, something like that. But very rare to use violence involving the, the organized crime, the syndicates like Mexico or Colombia, cartel, etc. Most of them focusing on illicit drug trafficking and trading. Uh, they, some case they ally or some case, most of, most of things, they uh, independent, independent organizing drug tra trafficking from Southeast Asia to Australia. Uh, and loose structure, prefer their family ties. And as I mentioned earlier, they establish fellow countrymen association, for example, Hai Phong or Nghệ An. And Vietnamese Dipora's uh, community have accounted for the uh, around uh, four and a half million citizens living, working across 110 national in six different reasons. It's a big huge. According to 2016 uh, census recorded the Vietnamese population in Australia rank as the sixth largest globally with the population roughly uh, more than 200,000. Uh, that means equivalent 3.6% uh, of Australia 
oversee bond population. However, under the Australian Bureau of Statistics 2020-20, and based at a, the 13th June 2020 last year, they revealed the Vietnamese bond prisoners was ranked uh, recorded at the top three highest rate among offenders committing the more serious crime. In particular, 789 prisoners. This rare only lower than Australia or New Zealand, but higher than the prison from the United Kingdom and China. I mean, the prisoners hey, you in have Australia. Three minutes left. Yep. I'm just going to say you have three minutes left. Yep. Uh, the first, the Parliamentary Judge uh, Committee uh, on the National Crime Authority, 1995, as they won a concern relating criminal gangs within Vietnamese community. Unfortunately, until now, after uh, more than the, uh, 30 years, no more the specific uh, uh, inquiry or the report focusing on Vietnamese cannabis syndicate. Uh, uh, the big question is the nexus of immigration and crime among Vietnamese community in, the, in Australia still lacking. Uh, three years ago, uh, ABC News, biggest uh, TV channel in Australia, they proposed their audience that you have almost certainly seen cannabis grow house. You just don't know it. But in fact, this still Asian a long time ago, at least since 2000s in the Vietnamese syndicate. I'm, I'm quite lucky uh, to meet and catch up with the author of the bestseller book in the Vietnam currently, uh, who are, was inside cannabis grower and sentenced uh, 30 months in the Melbourne jail, now to come back in the Vietnam. And he's uh, Green Road's Vietnamese book and hopefully English version coming soon. Sharing is very detailed and insightful information uh, how structure uh, Vietnamese cannabis structure in, in Australia. Uh, uh, it is a, it's a Vietnamese name book uh, for Green Far Way Road. It's a memoir of the Vietnamese uh, cannabis grower in Australia. Uh, this book uh, sharing uh, who they are and how they structure and uh, how they connecting and how they uh, modus operandi is very, very detailed with the more than uh, 254 page uh, book. It's a you very interesting. Left side. Yep. And uh, it's such a heading case. Grower had become a mouse, and one that could catch the cats roughly is the police. They will use uh, facilitate set up a ring and design his cannabis indoor, etc in order to avoid the monitor and the arrest by police. It is very interesting why they use the cat and mouse game. Who they are, look, as I mentioned. Sorry, I, I and, uh, to ask you for conclude for the sake of time. Yeah, it's the last slide. I want to share in structure with the three levels. Uh, limited time, but you can look in the, the link in the phone's paper. I sharing in the Asian crime and security. Thank you so much. It's from my email here and uh, very welcome Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, hi, thank you very much. Um, we'll remind the audience that you can write the questions in the chat for, for the question part. Now I'm happy to introduce Anna Greta Pekarinen and she's gonna talk to us about the business models and modus operandi of labor trafficking. Anna, welcome, Anna Greta. You're on, 10 minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Islas. Um, are the organizers able to start my uh, presentation, please? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so um, good evening or good night uh, from uh, Helsinki. Uh, my name is Annegret Beckerinen, and it's an honor to take part in this panel and learn from such an international group of experts. So thank you for having me. I'm going to talk about my topic very briefly today, but first a few words on my employer. So I work as a junior researcher for the European Institute for Crime Prevention and Control, also known as HEONI. Um, HEONI is an independent research and policymaking institute, and we're located in Helsinki, Finland, and work under the auspices of the Ministry of Justice. 
Um, a Teuni uh, research on labor exploitation and trafficking has been done since 2008. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit uh, about our recent project flow. Um, the full name of the project was Flows of Illicit Funds and Victims of Human Trafficking, Uncovering the Complexities. And it focused on the links between labor exploitation and financial crimes. Um, the funding came from the EU and Heoni's project partners were the University of Tartu from Estonia, uh, the Latvian Ministry of Interior and the Center for the Study of Democracy in Bulgaria. Uh, data was collected from desk reviews, interviews and workshops in the four uh, project countries and also during a study trip to uh, Belgium. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so a bit of context on the phenomenon of labor exploitation and trafficking for forced labor. Um, so, as you know, a growing number of uh, labor exploitation cases have been identified in Europe, um, for example, in the agriculture, cleaning, catering, construction, hospitality, transportation and manufacturing sectors. Um, labor exploitation and trafficking are driven by the possibility to make a profit on many levels and businesses benefiting from, from exploitation are not limited to, to just uh, criminal organizations. Um, in fact, it's often a chain of legitimate uh, businesses that are engaging in labor exploitation, either knowingly or unknowingly. And in the Finnish context, we have noticed that traffickers are often relatives or acquaintances of the victims. And in cases where migrants are concerned, they often share the same country of origin as the perpetrators. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, one of our publications uh, called Shade Business, uncovering the business model of labor exploitation. Um, the aim here has been to um, raise awareness um, on the model um, in which um, methods ranging from gray, uh, legal to gray to illegal are used to run a business. And our attention has been on the, on the exploitation of workers as well as associated economic crimes. Um, the slideshow is a page with an example of a subcontracting sub chain and due to time constraints, I won't go too deeply into it, but um, basically the main contractor here was a petrol company. Underneath it is an owner of a gas station franchise. Uh, and then another subcontractor provided workers for the gas station. And there was actually quite severe labor exploitation taking place at the lower end of the chain in these gas stations, um, as well as money laundering and tax and social contribution fraud. Uh, but the main contractor and the franchise owner were not knowingly involved in it, um, whereas the perpetrators were making quite good money from it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here I will uh, briefly present to you the business model of labor exploitation. Um, so the ways of profit making are cost reduction and revenue generation by the use of forced labor. So first I will briefly talk about cost reduction strategies, which are presented um, in the visual on the left side. Um, so the strategy relies on the reduction of labor costs through um, either underpayment or with, with uh, holding payments entirely. Uh, making the victims work longer hours, um, not providing the legally required conditions for a uh, safe and healthy work environment, and the evasion of taxes, as well as um, the evasion of social and health contributions. Uh, the second way of profit making is the revenue generation strategy. Um, it relies on imposing upfront fees to the victims. So, for example, fees on um, securing their job placement abroad, or uh, fees for compulsory trainings, um, as well as then an inflation of costs. Uh, and these costs may be related to, for example, transportation, housing, food, clothes, or work equipment uh, and tools that are necessary for, for doing the job. And there may be some legitimate costs, but often the uh, employers overcharge, for example, for um, substandard housing, and they make a profit from that. And then these costs are often uh, deducted straight from the employee's wages, which then results in severe underpayment. And often the perpetrators use a mixture of these two um, strategies uh, to maximize their profits. Next slide, please. Um, uh, five minutes left, Tammy. Sorry? Uh, five minutes left. Thank you. Um, so, yes. Um, we could say that this, this um, labor exploitation is definitely a structural issue. Um, it's a low risk, high gain form of corporate crime that's motivated by profit making. Um, especially when exploitation doesn't quite amount to human trafficking, um, in many countries it falls under some kind of uh, labor law violation, in which case the sanctions for the perpetrators tend to be very low. 
Um, these legal structures are often used um, to hide these kind of activities and illicit flows. So, for example, cascade subcontracting, uh, posting of worker schemes, bogus self-employment, and the use of fronts or strawmen. Um, for example, in many sectors, long and complex um, subcontracting chains and supply chains are used to hide these activities from the main contractor as well as authorities. And all the paperwork, etc., might seem like completely in order, but when you scratch the surface, then something completely different is um, uh, revealed from underneath. Uh, labor exploitation is often also uh, linked to other economic crimes, such as tax evasion, um, accounting fraud, corruption, and unfair competition. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so if the crime is financial or financially motivated, then we uh, need investigation techniques that correspond to that. So uh, final, uh, financial investigation techniques can help find evidence of trafficking and tracking the financial transactions and assets of both the suspects and the victims can reveal, for example, these kind of suspicious transfers or disposals, um, evidence of kickbacks where victims have to pay back uh, part of their wages to the employer, and then the victim's bank accounts, for example, might show no payments for living cost expenses, etc. Um, the prestige of crime and the freezing and confiscation of assets must be considered when the case is opened, and this is to make sure that the criminals are uh, deprived of the assets that they have uh, acquired illegally, um, and to prevent money laundering and any reinvestment in criminal businesses. And ideally, this will also facilitate compensation payments to the victims in the end. Uh, next slide, please. Just to show you a picture of one of our uh, products, this is an investigation tool for law enforcement and a very concrete checklist for labor inspectors uh, based on possible indicators of, of exploitation and can be used on inspection visits. And next slide, please. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, these and Heoni's other publications can be found on our website. And we are currently starting a new project called Elect THB. It will delve deeper into the modus operandi, the roots and the business model of the perpetrators of labor trafficking in, in Finland, Estonia and Latvia, and also analyze the commonalities and differences in relation to trafficking for sexual exploitation. And hopefully we'll be able to share the results in 2022. So I think there's only the final slide left. Thank you, this was my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. And please feel free to contact me for further information. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Greta, for that amazing presentation on uh, labor trafficking, which is, I guess, a subject that is sometimes overlooked, but very, very important these times. Um, now, I'm happy to present our next speaker. I remind all of you that if you have any questions, you can write them also in the chat or in the Q&A uh, part. Um, our next speaker is Donato Vopsa. Uh, from the University of Roehampton, London, Roehampton, London, and he will present about organized criminal groups and the professional enablers breaking the partnership in crime in the area of taxation. So, with no more time, I'll I'll give you Donato. You're welcome, Donato. Thank you very much. Good evening from uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Donato Vox, a lecturer in law at the Faculty of um, Business and Law um, of the University of Roehampton. I'm uh, currently co-editing a volume on tax crimes in the European Union, and uh, my recent research focuses on the relationships between organized crime and uh, uh, tax crimes. Uh, today, my presentation focuses on organized criminal groups and professional enablers in the field of taxation. Uh, this presentation first introduced in the debate the notion and concept of organized tax crime in order to identify its nature and main characteristics. Additionally, uh, we discussed the key role that professionals often play in order to design and perpetrate organized tax crime from a national and cross-border perspective. And the last but not least, this presentation focuses uh, um, on the need to address these specific business crime models and call for rethinking the role of professionals in the crime prevention. This presentation is based on an ongoing study and two book chapters that are going to be published. And uh, 
focuses only on some of the research findings considering the short time available. The relationships between uh, organized crime and taxation are manifold. Uh, here, uh, I think it's useful to mention at least the following two cases. The first is uh, the illegal taxation of businesses by organized criminal groups. And the second is uh, tax, uh, concerned tax crimes perpetrated by organized criminal groups. As you know, there are organized criminal groups that impose uh, illegal taxes on businesses. And the concept of illegal taxation covers, for example, the cases of a protection money or tax protection paid by business to certain criminal groups. Many organized criminal groups have a lawful income based on extortion and business protection. Organized criminal groups act as tax agencies and law enforcement agencies using illegal methods and are really effective in collecting protection money. Generally, organized criminal groups have accountants, not necessarily professional, but they manage their income, like the proceeds of crime and expenditure. One of the goals of criminal groups is to make profits by committing a wide range of offenses or infiltrating legitimate business. So tax evasion and tax fraud that are generally consider the economic crimes against the public financial interests are one of the purposes of various criminal organizations. We know uh, that uh, there is a significant tension in the literature to the investigation and prosecution of some gangsters for tax offenses. This is the case of Al Capone. But we need more research in order to analyze the interconnection between organized crime and tax fraud on a global scale. Various investigations in multiple jurisdictions reveal that at the moment the variety and magnitude of tax crimes committed by organized criminal groups. For example, in this presentation, we make reference to some recent cases, or 2021, extrapolated from the database of the news published by the European Union Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation. In October 2021, for example, a transnational investigation dismantled an organized criminal groups involved in VAT fraud through the manipulation of cash registers. Despite organized tax crime uh, being a widespread phenomenon, a few authors focused on this concept and phenomenon. Recently, uh, De La Feria has defined the organized value-added tax fraud as coordinated and systematic actions with varying levels of sophistication and organization with the aim of obtaining an unlawful financial advantage. And these tax crimes are, are prevalently perpetrated by organized criminal groups. We think that this notion referred to organized value-added tax fraud is an excellent starting point for a broader definition of organized tax crime, including tax fraud, customs fraud, and excise fraud. The type of tax crimes committed by organized criminal groups are manifold. Uh, Anna has explained someone, some interconnection with labor exploitation, and we have no time now to discuss them here. But who are the enablers of organized tax crime? An enabler can be broadly defined as anyone or anything that facilitates the commission of tax offenses by organized criminal groups. There are many types of enablers, for example, law institutions, individuals. For example, in the European Union, Tax fraud committed by organized criminal groups is often linked to the weaknesses of law and the lack of harmonization. Organizational or structural deficiencies in the enforcement of crimes enable the perpetration of customs fraud as demonstrated by investigation of the European Anti-Fraud um, Office. And uh, individuals can often be enablers, like a professional making and selling evasion schemes. On this point, giving uh, the limited time available, this presentation will briefly mention the role of a profession, lawyers or accountants. In the academic debate, attention has been paid to the role of professional enablers in the context of economic crime, such as money laundering. This is a, the case of a recent work of Levy. In the existing literature in the area of taxation, there is also a great focus on professionals who enable both tax crimes or, and tax avoidance. 
but the relationship between organized criminal groups and professional enablers in the specific field of tax evasion, tax fraud, has long been underexplored. But we know that professionals play a key role in developing tax evasion schemes by reducing the risk of detection, investigation, seizure, and confiscation. And this is the case of missing trader schemes in view. The cases in which professionals contribute to commission of tax offenses are numerous. One example that is considered here, uh, public prosecutors uh, in Italy uh, are able to investigate several cases where professionals have supported organized criminal groups in, in the perpetration of tax offenses. And uh, currently we have in Italy many decisions in this field. For example, we have a recent investigation against a lawyer uh, in connection with the offense of organized tax crime. The lawyer identified the strategies to achieve the group's fraudulent purpose and also conceal the proceeds of a crime. And uh, according to the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation, a professional has the role of organizer when an organized criminal group exists and uh, specifically the organizer give a con gives a contribution that is structurally essential to the organization of the association. So partnerships in crime between professionals and organized criminal groups have significant negative effects on the ability of law enforcement agencies to identify and disrupt criminal offenses. But there is a, still a, a lack of studies specifically exploring the causes that lead professionals to cooperate with organized criminal groups. And the analysis of these factors is relevant to identify innovative strategies to counter this phenomenon. These strategies to crack down on professionals enabling tax and white collar crime have recently been suggested by Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. This is a, a report of 2021. And these strategies aim to strengthen the skills and competencies of tax crime investigators in identifying professional facilitators, develop a multidisciplinary strategies to uh, counter the behaviors of professional enablers uh, and enhance cooperation between authorities, and to appoint an agency in each jurisdiction with responsibility for overseeing the implementation of the professional enabler strategies. But this strategy is developed with reference with tax crimes and the role of professional enablers. So it remains a, an, op an open question. Which other solutions can be adopted to make the specific partnership in crime between organized criminal groups and professional enablers? And here the research is still ongoing. In conclusion, one minute. organized tax crime is a type of organized crime deserving specific attention from a police making and law enforcement perspective, and also in the research. The role of private actors, in particular professionals, in the perpetration of organized tax crime is often essential and that impacts the responsabilization strategy of the private sector. And last but not least, and this is a, uh, the main question for the public, policymakers and law enforcement agencies are called for discussing and introducing new strategies to break this uh, complicated partnership in crime between organized criminal groups and professionals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donato. Thank you for that great, really interesting uh, presentation. I remind the audience that if you have any questions, you can post them in on the chat or also you can uh, write them on the Q&A or wait for our discussion time. Uh, well, our next presenters are uh, Alexandra, sorry, I'm Alexandra Drobninas and Maria Schupa. And they will deliver a presentation on the topic of criminal migration in Lithuanian uh, online media or crimigration in Lithuanian online media. And well, I remind you have uh, 10 minutes and welcome guys to this conference. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, Daryl. So uh, uh, our presentation probably will be uh, from the uh, a bit different point. Uh, we concentrated not much on the uh, issue of uh, uh, 
uh, real social or criminal facts, but re uh, rather on the, its uh, uh, perception uh, in public discourse. And, and sometimes uh, um, this presentation is continuation of our previous presentations that we uh, uh, done uh, uh, on uh, in, in the same format of uh, this uh, conference, but uh, years ago uh, we concentrated more on. Uh, um, uh, documentary fiction and uh, mythological uh, structure of uh, presentation for organized group. Uh, and uh, right now uh, uh, we turn our attention to a very dramatic event uh, that happened uh, just recently and it's uh, still uh, continued to happen. Uh, it's a uh, uh, migrant crisis, a crisis uh, on uh, Lithuanian uh, Belarus, Belarus border. Uh, and I want to uh, invite uh, my uh, young colleague, colleague uh, Maria Schuppe just to uh, present basic idea and preliminary result of uh, our research. Please, Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a project that is very hot off the plate because uh, the situation is ongoing. So uh, I will introduce briefly what is happening and then uh, continue to the ideas that we are trying to uh, carry out with our um, small research. Uh, project. So first of all, we have um, a migrant crisis on the Belarus-Lithuania border. Uh, it has started several months ago. Uh, at the end of May, there were first signs in the media that uh, Lukashenko is kind of threatening um, Lithuania to be flooded with uh, migrants. And in a few more weeks, uh, somewhere around the middle of June, um, there are uh, very sure reports of increased illegal border crossings. Uh, so this is uh, more or less when the problem starts um, forming uh, in the media and in public consciousness. Uh, the beginning of August uh, was uh, when the pushback policy was enacted. It is a controversial policy where uh, border guards and uh, other law enforcement agencies uh, basically uh, do not allow migrants to cross the border and uh, order those who have crossed the border already just to turn around and come back to um, the country that they have just left. And uh, further, um, in the intervening months, uh, September and, and October, uh, the initial hype was kind of calmed down, uh, but the problem was uh, still um, ongoing. And then there was an escalation in November, as some of you may have uh, heard. Uh, there was a major incident at the Polish uh, border with a, a large group of migrants allegedly um, trying to cross and reacting violently to the Polish border guards. And that was uh, probably one uh, of the key reasons why a state of exception was announced in the border area in Lithuania uh, starting November 10th. Right now, uh, there is a discussion on whether or not it should be prolonged for another month. So this is the problem in a nutshell. And uh, just to give you a better idea of how uh, it escalated and why for a country like Lithuania, which for a long time uh, really um, had migration as a kind of invisible problem, invisible issue, uh, a bit uh, like this, this will never happen uh, around um, Lithuania. This was the more or less general attitude. So uh, what happens right here, you can see a, a graph of number of illegal migrants that were detained and registered. Uh, and uh, I think this is very clearly uh, the point where the pushback policy was enacted and very, very few migrants are allowed to stay on Lithuanian territory, even though uh, it's uh, growing a bit uh, since then. And this is the magnitude of how uh, the number increased from almost zero or uh, very close to zero and um, up to several thousands. Uh, this is also some numbers uh, that put uh, law enforcement in perspective. So the number of officially persecuted cases of illegal border crossing and illegal trafficking has also increased compared to last year, although the numbers are not quite as dramatic as uh, the number of migrants that uh, are registered. And there's quite a lot of uh, research going on in international media on the routes that are being taken. Um, 
from uh, several uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, mostly from uh, Iraq uh, to Belarus and then on to the Polish and Lithuanian border and then uh, allegedly also to Germany. So um, we base our um, need to understand what's happening in the public discourse uh, because uh, there was a very uh, obvious gap. Uh, the gap was uh, that, um, as we know from uh, previous literature, which is really extensive, is that uh, very often criminal networks are involved in the organization support and promotion of illegal migration. But uh, on the other hand, what we see in uh, the media is not just uh, a mirror of this process, but rather a social myth of uh, what is going on, which is not necessarily uh, very reflective of reality. So uh, we went uh, to see what's happening. Maria, Maria, sorry, you have three minutes left. Yes, thank you. So uh, we went to see what's um, happening. Uh, we collected um, about uh, 100 uh, articles which were the most popular or the most visible in uh, the largest uh, online news website in Lithuania uh, out of a total of 700. And then uh, we also had a more targeted selection procedure for uh, another collection of articles uh, which included publications focusing on organized crime networks, well, not focusing, but mentioning rather, organized crime networks, uh, smuggling of human beings, etc. And we tried to compare what's going on there. And um, obviously this uh, second collection was not, not very popular at all. It was uh, almost uh, invisible, judging by the uh, number of comments and shares and such. So. Uh, these are some of the very, very initial preliminary uh, results. What we started with was uh, word frequencies, and we more or less lemmatized the Lithuanian texts and then um, translated the results uh, into English for uh, you to see. And um, as you can see, there are these two word clouds, and these are the most popular articles, and these are the selected publications that are at least mentioning organized crime in relation to the migrant crisis. And what you can see here is uh, a few key um, facts. So first of all, um, the larger and more central words are the ones that are most associated with these topics and most frequently used. And they're quite similar. So uh, most of uh, the articles focus on actually Lithuania, the border, Lithuania and Belarus as this kind of uh, duality uh, migrants, of course. And um, there are not too many uh, differences. Uh, one of the main differences is that uh, this kind of uh, alternative uh, discourse, uh, it focuses less on ensuring security, which is very evident here, and uh, more on uh, the global aspects of the other countries that are involved, especially as you can see here, for example, Iraq, uh, also Germany must be somewhere right here. Uh, also, uh, there's a bit more focus on asylum problems and human rights. And as you can see, the key difference, I think, is summarized here, where uh, this um, cloud has a situation as one of the key words describing what is happening. And uh, this cloud has a human uh, aspect to it. So to conclude, uh, we have a lot of uh, questions and of of course, a lot of ideas of how to further uh, continue understanding what is happening. Uh, but um, mainly, uh, what I would say is that there's a substitution. So rather than talking, uh, or at least bringing into meaningful discussion, the global criminal networks that are involved in organizing and supporting this particular migration crisis, they're substituted by the figure of uh, Alexander Lukashenko, the Belarusian authoritarian leader, uh, who is uh, portrayed as this kind of single-handedly uh, organizing uh, the crisis, the right, the ruthless um, perpetrator of it. And uh, the focus is rather local on the uh, bilateral relations between Lithuania and Belarus, uh, 
kind of border skirmishes rather than um, illegal migration as a global process. Um, so this lack of serious discussion also means that some of the dangers uh, of global pre-migration are um, unfortunately still invisible, although very, very close to the Lithuanian border. So uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm finishing the sharing now. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Alexandras, for that very interesting presentation. And Lithuania is very, very beautiful, by the way. Um, well, so now we have heard all of you now, and it's time for the Q&A and discussion session. Um, so I, I invite all of our attendees, if you have a comment or do you want to make a comment or a question, you can either raise your hand or write it in the chat. But to start, um, well, I'll, I'll make a question or a couple of questions to, to you guys. So my first question is to Anna, Anna Greta. You talk about labor exploitation. And in that point, there are organizations and criminal organizations that are, that are interested or that are actively working to create a network of labor exploitation. However, these, these organizations are usually outside uh, the law or outside a legal institution. Can it be the case that it is inside the government that you can have a network of labor trafficking and labor exploitation? And I mean this referring to countries in which uh, maybe there are labor laws, but those laws are not followed. And if the people do not want to, to, to obey the orders of the bosses, they get um, fired. Could that account to a social, to a construction of a labor exploitation, labor trafficking network, even if it's inside the government? And would that be considered a crime? Um, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting one and quite um, a difficult one as well. Um, I, I would say that definitely would constitute as um, labor exploitation, um, although coming from a totally different view that, than uh, from where we've looked into the issue. Um, but yeah, definitely something to, to take a closer look at. And unfortunately, I can't really... Um, don't really have any any direct answer to that, but um, uh, definitely an interesting point. So thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, I think you had um, a question in the chat, right? Here, Candrace Ross asks, are the Vietnamese pot seaters also owning the pot and distributing it? And are they working for or with other organized crime groups? How are they moving the laundry and laundering their money? Could you also elaborate on that if you want? I know I, I know you answer it already, but could you, for the audience that hasn't read the chat, could you also elaborate a little bit about it? Yeah, thank you for your question. <laughs> a little bit disrupt with the, the parallel with the, my online examination. But thank you so much for your question, uh, Candy Rose. Yeah, as I mentioned in the chat box, it's the, depending on each situation, small, medium, or large case study, they will cover or not cover by themselves regarding to pot or is the other distribution relating to process of the cannabis, uh, cannabis growing. Uh, according to my current data, because I collect over 300 cases based on the Commonwealth uh, law in uh, each state, for example, Victoria, New South Wales or Queensland, even the West and North, South and Australia, uh, currently since uh, 2000s and now, more than the 300 cases relating to the Vietnamese crops uh, sister, uh, they most of them are covered by their manager, level two or level one as uh, my sharing structure. Because uh, as you can see, the three very structure, three levels, and unfortunately, most crop sisters uh, it uh, belong to level three are most dangerous position to look after daily indoors. Not much evidence demonstrate those crop sisters to link directly organized crimes, particularly non-Vietnamese organized crimes. They not link, although some uh, they uh, they big boss level one 
could be involved, particularly money laundering, as you the prop and as you guess. However, law enforcement still lack their strong evidence to profit. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for that very interesting insight. Um, well, my next question is for Donato. Donato Fotza. Um, can you listen? Can you hear me, Donato? Yeah. Okay. I'm cool. here. Yeah, uh, a kind reminder to all of our speakers that you can turn your camera on if you if you want. Um, so you talk about the taxation by crime, right? Uh, and you and you talk about your enablers. Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I remember Thanks. in your in your slide you put three main enable enablers or catalog of enablers. Yeah. Can you elaborate? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. That's a really an interesting question. Um, first, the concept of, of, of enabler. Uh, the concept of enabler um, is associated generally just to professional. Uh, according to, to our research and also our findings, uh, uh, the concept of an enabler is uh, extended. Generally, we include uh, within this notion, not just uh, the professionals, institutions, banks that facilitate tax crimes or money laundering or other crimes, but also uh, the legal and institutional factors that facilitate these crimes. So I think that this is a, an extremely relevant point because sometimes policymakers are also enablers. And this uh, is a crucial point, especially in terms of, um, of legislation. So sometimes we need to react uh, to uh, uh, this phenomenon, first of all, through um, the laws and avoiding that the law uh, can be an involuntary enabler of a crime. Um, this is the, 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 the first relevant point about uh, the dimension and the concept of enabler. Uh, then about the role uh, of these enablers, uh, we can distinguish in, in direct of taxation, like uh, I have said, between uh, at least based the, uh, on, um, uh, on our findings, but uh, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that there are uh, manifold ideas about uh, uh, this point. Uh, the role that the tax enablers uh, generally have uh, in the field of tax avoidance. At the moment, there is a, a larger literature on the um, role of professionals uh, and institution uh, and other uh, banks uh, in setting uh, uh, shell companies uh, to facilitate tax avoidance. But tax avoidance, uh, as you know, generally is a legal thing. There is uh, less attention, and uh, this is a paradox, uh, on uh, uh, the side of the enablers of tax crimes, and especially of organized tax crime. Why I have decided to include in my slide an example of a lawyer that uh, is an organizer of organized criminal, a promoter of an organized criminal groups. Uh, or organized criminal group, because uh, we have uh, now cases where professionals decide to uh, set an organization and uh, perpetrate tax offenses. So generally, as you know, in the within the legislation, we have uh, on one side uh, aggravating circumstances. This is, for example, the case of, uh, of Italy, of professionals that enable um, tax crimes. But we have also an aggravating treatment for uh, organized uh, criminal groups. Why? Because uh, these uh, phenomena and these uh, different phenomena combined together are really serious uh, and then can impact uh, really on, on the public budget of a country. Uh, so at the moment, uh, mm, this is the focus of, uh, of my research. Um, and uh, we are still exploring the cases that we have where lawyers, accountants, and other professionals uh, are involved uh, in this area. But please consider that uh, the typology and the quantity of enablers may be manifold. We, in this case, we are talking about professionals, but we have cases of public officials within tax administrations uh, that uh, uh, are involved in organized criminal groups and facilitate the perpetration of a customs fraud, for example. So this is a really an interesting concept. And uh, we think that really enablers uh, have an important role in the perpetration 
of uh, these typology uh, typologies uh, of, of crimes, and especially uh, thanks to them, there is the opportunity um, of an increasing role of uh, organized uh, criminal group with groups within uh, um, uh, the, the, in the context of, of economic crime. That, uh, like Professor Albanese said, is now a financial crime with serious implications. So not just look uh, uh, to immigration or uh, traditional crimes that are extremely important, but we need to shift, like many said also, some attention to the part of economic crime. And the enablers here have a serious and important role. Thank you very much, Diorella. Thank you, Donato, for that really, really vast explanation. As you can see, tax enablers are, are very important, actually. Oh, sorry, my camera. Yeah, so elaborating a little bit on that, just for, for a while, Donato. Um, what about non-organized uh, tax crimes? For example, you can see in some countries uh, in, which, um, in which informal economy is wide, people do not pay taxes and they are still committing a crime, right? And in some cases, the informal economy is so vast in terms of how much people is doing it, that if you could only tax maybe the 1% of the income, you can get much more than, than many of uh, middle, middle level or, or um, uh, the first of the, high, of the high companies. So what do you think about that? Shall we consider that still unorganized, even when all those, all those um, businesses are working like organized? That, that, that's an interesting uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, re really, I, I think in this moment, uh, the issue of uh, tax evasion is really you know, the center of the agenda uh, in the world, uh, and uh, the issues uh, are manifold. Uh, really, we have uh, on one side citizens, uh, on the other side, uh, we being people and the business, uh, especially multinational companies. Really, if we think, uh, and this is beyond uh, organized criminal groups, um, the role that the multinationals play in avoiding the payment of taxes by exploiting the mismatches between the tax systems, uh, we are able to know that at the moment, uh, uh, the, the really, the, the, the most important problem is uh, how to um, counter tax avoidance in the world. And this is at the center of the agenda of uh, uh, the OECD. Um, as regards uh, uh, individuals, uh, generally uh, we know that uh, yeah, citizens um, don't pay taxes, but we are in front of a, an individual crime, so a crime perpetrated by uh, individuals. And uh, there is a need, of course, to target uh, these crimes, but we are beyond uh, the mm, uh, the concept and also the phenomenon of organized uh, criminal groups. Uh, the organized uh, criminal groups uh, uh, work in, in a different way. They set businesses, like you said, and generally they perpetrate a crime uh, through um, a special vehicle. Um, this is the case, for example, of the uh, missing trader um, um, fraud in, in the context uh, of the European Union. But yeah, the, the, the issue is really uh, interesting uh, uh, and I hope uh, we will have more time to talk about uh, it and how to solve um, uh, the, the, this, uh, this problem. At the moment, uh, there is also an internet connection between, uh, uh, as you know, and this is uh, beyond uh, a, a strict interlinked uh, tax crime, is the is a relationship between organized tax crime um, and uh, and money laundering because at the same time we know that uh, organized tax crime is facilitated by other typology of crimes and by other enablers uh, at the national or international level. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Donato. Yeah, and uh, for those of you interested in in this tax tax evasion and tax crimes, you can also look, Google the case of Guatemala in which a uh, network of of tax evasion and tax crime. Uh, gang, when it was published or when it was leaked, the, the conflict in the in the country was so huge 
that it forced the um, renunciation of the president and the vice president of the country. So it's a very serious issue at the moment. Well, I'm going to address now another question from uh, Hendrix Nkamikania, if I, I'm sorry if I pronounce your, if I mispronounce your last name. So he's asking uh, to Alexandra and Maria, uh, how much do they, spend, do they send people who come to Belarus? And are the Africans who pass by Belarus, are there Africans who pass by Belarus to enter in Europe? I'm not sure, Hendrix, if you want to uh, elaborate on your question or if that's okay, if you're in... Mm, uh, it's a, a problem. I'm, I'm a bit uh, tricky with uh, who are they. Uh, it's uh, uh, Belarus, uh, Belarus regime or those who, these criminal networks who actually just send them to Belarus and then to the uh, eastern border of your Euro European Union. So it's uh, uh, it's uh, in this case it's um, there are no very very strong figures you know because uh, the pro this process you know uh, right now has changed a bit because we have uh, on the one hand uh, as uh, Maria already show uh, it's a uh, traffic um, uh, to Minsk as a as a hub. And uh, after, uh, you know, it's uh, again, it's not calculated completely how many people, you know, just reach the border and what kind of border is reached because uh, some of uh, migrants goes to Lithuanian border, some to Poland, Polish border, some to Latvian border, and other to Ukrainian. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not, not, not very, very, very well calculated still. And another one is another process what we have here uh, in Belarus at least. Uh, that uh, uh, some migrants, you know, just send back to to the uh, to their, um, uh, their home countries, uh, and it's uh, it's it's also fixed cases. Uh, uh, as for the uh, uh, Africans uh, who uh, passed uh, by Belarus to enter to Europe, again, it's uh, we have a Frontex data uh, for whole uh, Eastern European border and. Uh, uh, there are uh, there are uh, uh, people from from Africa as well, but uh, nevertheless, majority uh, 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 as I remember, complete might be Maria, Maria correct me, but it's uh, uh, most three um, countries. It's uh, from uh, from Iraq, uh, from uh, as I remember uh, Afghanistan or Syria, and from Russia. So Maria, probably you can, you can add this data. Uh, right, I can give uh, a brief update on that because um, I actually have the Lithuania hot data for this, and of course Iraq is in the first place. Uh, uh, but uh, from uh, Africa, there are also uh, a few hundreds of uh, people registered as uh, citizens of uh, Congo, and uh, a bit more than 100 from Cameroon. So this is the data that we have as of today. But this, of course, uh, that tells us nothing about the ones who have been pushed back or um, uh, did not reach this uh, official registration uh, process. Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Alexandra. And we have another question for you. Um, is the term cremigration useful in your analysis? And this question is from Dina Siegel. I'm sorry. Uh, I can answer very briefly, and I believe Alexandros will uh, expand. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed a question. Could could you repeat it? <laughs> I am sorry. Um, is the term cremigration useful in your analysis? And how I guess. Maria, please, uh, uh, probably. Uh, just a few uh, brief ideas. So uh, we had these uh, very interesting, two very interesting moments. One uh, was a wave of media publications uh, discussing the criminal subculture. Uh, I'm kind of citing here, rephrasing, uh, which is forming among migrants. Uh, so, um, and it's hard to discern fact from fiction there. Um, but this kind of media push of migrants as criminals, um, it was evident in that case. And the second one was uh, when uh, a prison site, um, the prisoners, the actual uh, Lithuanian um, 
prisoners uh, were moved to another facilities and migrants uh, were uh, accommodated in a freshly former prison site. Uh, and it was uh, lauded as a kind of a very safe um, solution. And even though the prison staff uh, stayed there to, to uh, look uh, over. Uh, as, as I understood the question, it's uh, you know it's uh, some kind of uh, uh, hidden meaning uh, or labeling meaning because if you use uh, you know you call uh, migrants as a criminals, you're already labeling them as as they are not a victim but uh, you know they're, they're like a threat to 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 the countries where they come to. So it's understandable. Uh, but uh, again, in this in, in this context, at least in our context, crime migration is uh, rather fair uh, to uh, to public reaction. And what we see, for example, on, in public discourse, especially in the first uh, day of uh, of these events, it's a very negative reaction. Uh, uh, not only uh, uh, concerning uh, the uh, Belarus regime, authoritarian regime, but also to those who uh, migrants who just uh, want to cross uh, the Lithuania or Poland because Lithuania and Poland is not a point of uh, of arrival point of arrival it's uh, more prosper countries of European Union like Germany or like France or maybe even Great Britain or, or Sweden so uh, uh, but uh, again it's uh, it's 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 a, it's a concern for uh, for our public policy what uh, to, to change you know uh, the the, the public attitude to, to this issue and uh, of course uh, from this point of view uh, we have to start uh, from uh, from what we have from from, uh, from symbolic facts and after to change the symbolic facts you know for, for more human humanitarian uh, uh, policy okay thank you thank you very much um uh, I need to ask the audience now, is there any more questions? Or do you want to add something about what you're researching and how it relates to our panelists? You're also welcome to do it. Okay, so uh, a comment on what Maria just said. So, and, and, and um, Alexandra's. So you mentioned about this this term immigration and how right now in in many aspects uh, establishing that migrants or forced migrants may be criminals or are criminals is part of of making them the criminals, right? Uh, how could governments act or and at this point I mean legally act to prevent the migrants from becoming uh, at some point part of the criminal networks. And I'm not saying criminals themselves because I understand sometimes uh, migrants come from different places and in their journey, they are forced to commit crimes to keep moving forward in, in their journey. Uh, and I'm projecting a little bit what's happening in the American continent in which we have we're seeing uh, migrants arriving from Africa, from uh, the Middle East right now, and they arrive to Brazil and they move forward to uh, the northern countries, going to Central America, Mexico, trying to get to the United States. But in the process, they are also being forced to commit crimes. They run out of money. They either get kidnapped or are forced to transport drug if they want to be helped by other people. So how could governments help? Uh, forced migration to prevent them from joining this cycle of crime or forced crime. Oh, it's a, thank you for very, very, very difficult questions. Uh, if uh, you know, if 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 I am uh, prime minister, probably it will be <laughs> it will be easy for me to answer uh, to your questions. Yeah. Uh, and, and I must say, you must do the answer in three minutes or left because that's what we have left now. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's impossible. I'm failed already. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but really, it's, it's serious questions. And it's it what we uh, have to work. Work not uh, 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 together with, with government because we have to change completely, to change uh, attitude to, to migrants. Uh, migrants, you know, the image of migrants is still negative. Uh, right now, we have already have you know the change of uh, of public attitude to migrants. You know, it's became more and more positive. You know, more and more humanitarian. Let's say, uh, 
uh, but uh, you can you can understand uh, that uh, governments uh, uh, sometimes uh, should uh, solve uh, uh, national problems as well, and uh, it's uh, not uh, they have enough sometimes so sometimes time and might be experience for for managing uh, this issue. It's incomparable, for example, the experience of the United States of America, for for example, or uh, most of uh, uh, European countries like Germany, for example, or like Sweden. So we have to learn it. We have to learn this uh, this uh, this lesson, and I hope that we will be successful. Not right now. Right now. We, we in, in the initial stage, the stage of, of learning. Thank you, Alexandra. And well, there's some, some food for thought. And well, I guess we're almost over with our panel. Um, I, will, I would like to thank you all. Thank you, Alexandra, Maria, Donato, Ana Greta, and Haitan. And thank you to all our attendees for being here today. As you can see, criminal enablers are really important because not only are they helpful to the criminals, but they are helpful to us as researchers to understand the phenomena and to uh, politicians and policymakers to be able to create better policies in order to counter uh, transnational organized crime. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the OC24 podcast. For more talks, have a look at the podcast feed on whichever platform you use. There are loads more to listen to. Video versions of these talks are also available on the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime YouTube channel. If you would like to share these talks around, we ask that you use the hashtag OC24 and let us know what you think. The 24-hour conference on global organised crime is brought to you by the European Consortium of Political Research Standing Group on Organised Crime, the Centre for Information and Research on Organised Crime, the International Association for the Study of Organised Crime and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. For more information, head over to oc24.globalinitiative.net. This has been the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thanks for listening.